web this morning. That's true. There's a new paper on the web this morning in this series. So, thank you, first of all, uh, Miriam and Ron and my friend in the back of the room, Bert Obru, who I have not seen in I don't know how long. Once, I was in the middle of Siberia, and that guy met me at a small town called Tom's, and I had come the easy way. I rode in on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. He came through China and the, and the, the Kyrgyzia, Kazakhstan. 1994. Yeah. And so we met, and I was like, oh my god. So this guy is an amazing person. For those of you who don't know where he is, just an amazing man. So I'm so happy to see him. It's been a long time since I've been here. OK, so um, I'm uh, Jim Gates. I, uh, as I was explaining to a group of students, I, I have a kind of cracked perception of things. I, I tend to see things a little bit differently from most of my colleagues. And so uh, as a consequence, when I was a graduate student at MIT, I was the first person there who, oh my goodness, this is your face. <laughs> uh, I was the first person at MIT in uh, around the uh, 75, 76 period who realized that this idea called supersymmetry was going to be really important for the future. And as a consequence, uh, I tried to convince faculty and fellow graduate students that we ought to try to learn something about this. I totally failed. And so I wound up writing the uh, uh, PhD thesis on supersymmetry, half my PhD thesis, which I submitted and defended in 1977, is on the subject of what was then the new concept of supersymmetry. So I've been studying supersymmetry essentially all of my professional years. The only thing really I ever wanted to understand deeply uh, in physics, uh, I've been fortunate enough to get through general relativity and quantum field theory and covariant uh, perturbation theory and all those things and phase transitions and things matter. You know, you go through all that stuff in graduate school, but this was my passion. And so uh, when I uh, got my PhD, I defended it in 1977. I went off to Harvard to become a postdoc and a junior fellow at Harvard. Uh, I was there from 77 to 80. And just as I was ending my time uh, in 1980, uh, I got an invitation from John Schwartz to come out to Caltech. Because John was interested in super things in those days. This is before he invented super string theory, but he was very interested in supersymmetry. And I had worked with a guy named Warren Siegel at Harvard, and we had produced some, some, th some things that some people thought was really good stuff, and John was one of those people. And so there's this problem that he was trying to solve Warren doesn't, I mean, most of you have never heard of my friend Warren Siegel, but Warren doesn't like to travel. So he just absolutely refused to go from the East Coast to the West Coast, which is kind of strange because he had been a student at Berkeley. So you would think that he would just want to go back. But I learned there's a vast difference between Berkeley and Los Angeles. So uh, I went out to Los Angeles by myself, and John and I worked on the problem for maybe six weeks, and we absolutely failed. And this particular problem has never been solved. And so, um, I, uh, in the middle 90s, I was uh, already a tenured professor. And in fact, I was on the verge of becoming a Dow, an endowed professor. And you know, one of the nice things about endowments is you don't have to explain to people what you're doing for money. You know, with an ordinary grant in SF, you have to be very rigorous and say, we're going to do this on this particular time scale, and you know, all that has to go into the proposal. But if you have an endowment, you have some flexibility in how you expend funds. And so I, had an, I was just about to, down professor. So I returned to look at this problem that John Schwartz and I had not been able to solve in 1979, uh, rather 1980, uh, when I had gone out to Caltech. And today I'm going to tell you about the adventure that that has launched us in. And we're, I think we're closing in on something. You, I'll let, let you judge uh, by the end of the talk what you think. Okay. Oops. It's not where I'm Back to the beginning. That's not the beginning of the talk. Here we are at the beginning. Okay. So, let's get started on this journey. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is remind you of some things on a couple, of about four or five, maybe six slides that you probably already know. Because certainly those of us who are um, particle physicists believe we know something about group theory. Now, it may not be at the depth that mathematicians know group theory. In fact, I, I've had the pleasure of, uh, uh, of uh, talking with mathematicians a lot. In fact, I often describe myself as a fallen mathematician. 
because my first bachelor's degree is actually in mathematics. I have a second bachelor's degree in physics. And so I did got the PhD in physics. So I'm a fallen mathematician, not really a mathematician. But uh, Ron was kind enough to say that I was raised properly, so I speak the language with very little accent. <laughs> so let's get started. Uh, one of the key things I'm going to focus on is the jordan Shevely decomposition of compact Lie algebras, which plays a critical role in our understanding the complete structure of compact Lie algebras. And in particular, eigenvalues and eigenvectors are extraordinarily important. So how does it work? <coughs> I'm going to start with the formula at the top. That formula for SU3 is the analog of what we physicists learn for SU2. We say uh, representation of SU2 has two J plus one states. Uh, but for SU3, there's a similar formula. It's the formula that you see there. It requires two integers, P and Q, in order to talk about the number of states in a particular representation. And, and it's given by that expression at the very top. It is a special case of a general formula that was derived by Weil for calculating the uh, dimensionality of representations of an arbitrary uh, compact Lie algebra. It involves on the second line mu, which are the roots of the representation of the represent of the uh, group that you're talking about, and involves uh, w h, which is the highest weight of the particular representation that you're looking at. If you translate that formula from what's on the second line to SU3 language, it looks like the thing on the first line. So, how does it come about? Well, for SU3, we know there are eight generators. Uh, they have structure constants, which you can go look up any textbook. And we know that by looking at the values of the structure constants, you can find a pair of the generators that commute to zero. And typically, we physicists call that the third component of the spin and the hypercharge. So we concentrate only on those two generators. In general, there is going to be n such generators for arbitrary compact group, compact group. And we ask the following question. For these generators that commute, what are the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues? And so for SU3, if you go through the exercise, you see what's in, uh, right under my transparency where I have eigenvectors and eigenvalues. You find there are three eigenvectors uh, that depend on two eigenvalues, uh, and that's the end of the game. For the rather remaining generators, those that are not in the maximum commuting torus, because that's what that commutation relationship between T3 and T8 define, we combine them into complex pairs. Uh, and we physicists like to call these complex pairs raising and lowering operators. So that's the uh, Shevely Jordan decomposition of a compact Lie algebra. Demonstrated explicitly on SU3, but it turns out all the complex, uh, compact Lie algebras that Cartan ever found, including the exceptionals, have this kind of structure. And uh, these uh, raising and lowering operators are very interesting. The eigenvalues define points on a lattice, first of all. And the raising and lowering operators, you can think of them as generating motions along the points of the lattice. So what I've illustrated here are the motions that are generated by what we physicists like to call I-spin, U-spin, and V-spin. Uh, I'm not sure if mathematicians have another name for these things, but that's how we talk about them. They generate motions around the lattice that defines the representation. And you can look at particular representations like the quark and the anti-quarks, which I've illustrated on this slide. Um, the quarks have that integer p equal to 1. The q, integer q is equal to 0. The anti-quarks are just the opposite. They have p equals 0 and q equal 1 is that dimensionality formula. And we can look at more complicated representations, such as the octet, the joint representation of SU3, or the decouplet, which is, in fact, the representation that forced us physicists to begin to learn group theory uh, in the 50s. I say one shaking head because they know the story. Basically what happened was there was a conference at CERN and uh, the particles at this level had just been detected uh, at the conference and it was a, just like we had the announcement of the Higgs boson a few years ago, there was a, such an announcement at CERN about the detection of these particles, which are the physicists of course are, I'm just mathematicians are just simply states of the representation. And uh, Murray Gelman was in the audience uh, after, at the end of the conference. And he, gave, he got up doing Q&A. At least this, I wasn't there, so this is a story that I heard. Maybe some can verify. And he said, he made a prediction. He said, on the basis of the discovery 
of these two particles, I will predict that you will find another particle with very similar properties. And because these were experimental observations, you can look to see the mass gap here. And so for this final prediction, you know, he used that number and said you'll find a particle with these properties at this mass level. <coughs> a few months later, I believe it was, the omega minus particle was found. And that's when we particle physicists were forced to learn generally, not just SU2, because we had known SU2 because of spin, but in general, had to start learning about non-appealing uh, compact Lie algebras. And of course, the end of that story is the standard model with SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, which the, whose structure is largely determined because we know the groups that underlie the symmetries that ar uh, arise from the elementary particles. Uh, there are other such representations. This is one that I'm not sure has a name, but this is the P equal, Q, P equal 7, the Q equal 3 representation. It looks like that. And so the point is that when you have deep knowledge of the representation theory of a compact group, you can actually describe uh, general properties of the representations of that group on the basis of some very fundamental formula, the roots and the weights. So those turn out to be the way to understand uh, representation theory, if you're going to understand it at the level of Cartan. The other thing that comes along with this game is that we learn how to use young tableaus in order to describe these representations. And the young tableau, interestingly enough, can be understood as simply a set of boxes. We only need two rows for SU3 because there are only two community generators. If you're starting with a bigger group, you're going to need taller young tableaus. And they're going to be more integers like P and Q that you need to describe the representations. But for SU3, this suffices. And what P does is simply measure the length of the longest box of the representation. And then uh, Q measures the box under that. And only two such rows, and so you're done in specifying representations uh, for SU3. And if you know how to use what's called the Hooke's Law, which allows you to calculate the dimensionality of representations, You'll, find, you'll go through Hooke's Law for this, and be able to calculate the representations of any corresponding figure that has a young tableau. That's understanding representation theory at its deepest level. So that's what we physicists do not yet know how to do for supersymmetry. And this problem that I could not solve with John Schwartz back in the 1980s, is a problem of this character. That is, we were looking for a particular representation and we did not succeed in finding it. So that's what drives me. I'm sorry, Mary, you want to say? Yeah. This works only for unitary symmetries, like computational yeah, yeah. symmetry and unitary symmetry. Yes. Right? One -to -one. That's why I emphasize compact. Yeah, but that's why I emphasize compact. So well, you can do some continuations, I agree, but. Uh, them. But you, you're right, I should emphasize uh, unitary. Okay, so. Oh, yes, please ask questions, by the way. This is not supposed to be a soliloquy. Okay, so the composition teaches us the importance of eigenvalues and eigenvectors in trying to understand the representation theory of something that looks like a group. So, um, what about supersymmetry? Can we apply Cartan's machinery to understanding the representations of supersymmetry? Now, let's be very careful because if you read the mathematical literature, back in the 80s, I think it was, there was a, a lot of work done on superalgebras. Um, but none of that work covers the case of space-time supersymmetry. So that's an open hole, as far as I understand the mathematical literature, that's an open hole still in the mathematical literature. And we're trying to actually fill that hole by building up an understanding of what's going on there. So uh, if you're going to do supersymmetry, maybe it makes sense to start with the simplest kind of supersymmetry that there is, which is one dimensional, one temporal dimension. So we're actually talking about super, what's called supercharged quantum mechanics. And in supercharges. So those symbols D that you see there represent the supercharges. And if they're supersymmetry, they have to satisfy that anti convergence relationship that you see in the first equation. Um, since there's a one continuous variable time, uh, the supercharges commute with time, and so that satisfies the, the second commutation. And of course, anything commutes with itself, so the third is a trivial. 
So that's the algebraic structure of in extended one-dimensional supersymmetry. Now, we're going to look at a particular kind of representation. We're going to uh, propose that there's a sort of representation that you can build from this algebra by simply taking bosons and fermions. In this uh, second line, you'll see an object I call phi. It's a boson. In the moment, we come to understand why it has to be a boson. And the object psi on the right-hand side of the equation is the fermions. The supercharge has to send bosons to fermions. That's what the first equation says. On the other hand, that same supercharge, when applied to a fermion, has to send. Oops, what's going on here? Sure. What? You think it's no? This. You need to restart. That's really weird. Did someone forget to put an electric? <laughs> Oh, we're, we're making progress. Okay. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, I don't think much of a Well, I can resort to the back blackboard. It's going to be good to see. Uh, okay, so it's a contact to my machine. Okay, so um, I'm, as I said, I'm proposing to study representations with, that contain bosons and fermions where the supercharges map them according to these equations. Now, in order for this to be supersymmetry, that is, in order for the condition of the first equation to satisfy, we need to impose on these objects, and they're just matrices, it just collects into numbers. Um, the other thing I want to say, uh, because I know that mathematicians like to be coordinate free, which is exactly the opposite from us, uh, so the index i runs from one to n, it counts the number of uh, supercharges, the index uh, lowercase i runs from 1 to d. It counts the number of fermion, of bosons I have in the system. And the index k hat in the equation also runs from 1 to d. It counts the numbers of fermions I have in the system. And so uh, these quantities L are actually matrices. And if we're going to get this condition to be satisfied, it turns out all you have to do is impose the three equations there on these matrices. Now, uh, those conditions may not look familiar. So let me try to make it a little bit more familiar. Let me construct a matrix which is twice as large as the L and R, and put the L and R in the off-diagonal entries. Because of these equations, you can convince yourself that these quantities gamma that I've defined here are Clifford generators. And they're, they're equal in number to the number of L's that we have. And this also answers a question which I wondered about when I was a graduate student, which is why. So it takes, if you have one fermion and one boson, you can realize one supercharge. If you have two bosons and two fermions, you can realize two supercharges. So if you have three bosons and three fermions, how many supercharges can you realize? The answer turns out you can't. In order to realize three supercharges, the minimum number of bosons and fermions that you need are actually four. And the reason for that is because when you try, if you look at the representation theory of Clifford algebras, you know that they have to go two to some power. And so that's why n equal 3 superchargers actually requires four fermions for a realization in terms of fields. So what is supersymmetry doing? Well, it's really about this Venn diagram. 
So in this Venn diagram, I have two collections, which uh, I call VL and VR. In a moment, we'll talk about them. And then I have a set of uh, linear transformations that act on the collections. One a set of uh, linear, trainers are, uh, trans uh, linear transformations will map objects in VR to VL. And I assume the order of both of these sets is the same, so the same number of objects in the same set, in each set. And I had a set of transformations to act on them. I can also consider additional transformations that start with one of these objects and maps it to itself, or starts with the other object and maps it to itself. What does it have to do with uh, bosons or fermions? Well, it works like this. The VL set you can think of as the collection of bosons in the theory. The VR set you can think of as the collection of fermions that we're talking about in the theory. The uh, linear transformations that map between the two are in this are in these sets MR and ML, and that's the structure of supersymmetry. So supersymmetry actually has two subspaces. You can think of them as subspaces, and you're looking at the classes of linear maps between these subspaces. So, question: How would you try to repeat? Cartan's or the Jordan Shelley Shelley Jordan decomposition on a set of transformations that sit in those two upper sets of transformations that I showed you, the ones that are mapping between different subspaces. The notion of an eigenvector makes no sense. Because for an eigenvector, you have to have a, some object, you transform it, and then the transformed object has to be compared back to the initial object that you start from. But if you're mapping between two spaces, that condition is never satisfied. And that's the reason why ordinary uh, Jordan, Chevrolet Jordan decomposition doesn't buy you anything in trying to understand the representations of the supersymmetry. What could you do? Well, uh, it's the anti commutator of the supercharges that are defined by the action of the group. You could say instead of considering commutators, let I'm sorry, anti-commutators, let me consider commutators. So take a super theory, apply the supercharges twice, but don't do the usual calculation that has to close on P. Do the opposite calculation where you change the sign. Because of the way we've chosen these representations, it turns out that what you'll find is that you get this result, namely that the two of the supercharges will in fact come back to this subspace of supercharges. It will come back with a time derivative, but nonetheless it comes back to that space. And if you do a Fourier transform, that time derivative is simply just thought about as a factor of P. And therefore, it begins to look like the kind of eigenvalue condition that you can try to find solutions for. So if you're going to build some kind of representation theory for supersymmetry, yet it's not the generators of supersymmetry themselves that will define the representation theory. It's got to be at least a quadratic product, because that's the first time you see things that look like eigenvectors and eigenvalues that are available to you. And of course, it's the same thing for the fermions. You have to apply two of these things. And so you get two other sets of majors, and we call them and tilde. We give them strange names, because we like to give strange names in our papers, so people wonder why we're doing that. And in terms of the Venn diagram, what we can see is that the, v, uh, the Vs without the tilde lie in the space where you're mapping from the left space back to itself. The V tildes are looking at the map where you're taking VR and mapping elements back into that space. Now we have something that looks like it might allow us to get to eigenvalues. So you have to have quadratic operators. So, uh, that's part of the story. In uh, 2006, working with one of, uh, one of Burke's uh, colleagues, a guy named Michael Fox, we started thinking about a graphical representation for supersymmetry. Because we knew all kinds of graphical representations for compact Lie operators, unitary groups. So could you construct such a thing? And in this paper with Michael, we succeeded in proving that you could. At least we started the process. The complete proofs didn't evolve until I started working much more closely with mathematicians, Charles Duran, Chuck Ega, and Greg Landweber. And I also worked with my physicist colleague, uh, Tristan Huch, who's done a lot of works on uh, Calabial manifolds. So what we found was, we thought, rather interesting. Namely, 
that if you start with a square and decorate it, it allows you to get to representations of supersymmetry. How does the decoration work? Well, you have to put two classes of vertices in the diagram. That represents the bosons and fermions. There are two classes of particles with VL and VR set. The lines in the square represent the orbits under the action of the supercharges. And then uh, we just say all parallel lines get the same color. What that's doing is specifying which value of capital I we're talking about. Is it the first supercharge, or is it the second supercharge, or the third supercharge, what have you. And then the final rule, well then the, there's another rule which says that you have to put a dashing on every square face of such a figure. And this dashing is a minus sign. So by decorating this graph, which technically for people who know graph theory, this is a bipartite regular graph that we're looking with, and we're defining various decorations that go on both the links and on the nodes. And then the final rule is you can't have in your graph two, a boson and a fermion at the same height, because height turns out to be important. Height is an, uh, is a, um, uh, is an alternate way to talk about the engineering dimensions of these objects. Because in physics, we know that you have to have engineering dimensions associated with field variables. And so no boson can have the same engineering dimension uh, as a fermion unless you're doing some kind of weird construct. Uh, but if you do the simplest construct, so you can have it. So this figure that I have here can yield two what objects that we call adinkras. And it's these adinkras that allow us to get to um, supersymmetry. Because what they are doing is they are graphical representations of the topology of the supercharges acting on the representation. So it's actually a topological object that we're looking at. So when we say square, we're not talking about something with the geometry of a square. We're talking about something that has the connections of a square. So we don't really care if you distort this figure as long as you keep those properties in mind. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, height is significant. Now, in a moment, I'm going to show you how to turn these pictures into sets of differential equations. But the height of the nodes actually determine various factors in the differential equations. And so, um, in this particular, comparing these class of, of diagrams, I can say this is at the B equal one level, this is at the B equal two level, and this is at the B equal three level. And we use the symbol B to recognize some work done by uh, Tom Bancroft, who was a mathematician at Brown. And at the, in the 1970s, he introduced uh, discrete morph, uh, Morse functions on two-dimensional oriented tri triangular meshes. And for physicists, what this means is take a diagram and Im imagine that it has a charge value associated. That's the B equal one, B equal two, B equal three. And yet, uh, if you take the approach that, uh, that Tom took, you actually are talking about Morse functions. And in fact, my colleague uh, Charles Duran is currently incorporating uh, the presence of Morse functions in the Dinkras. In fact, the Dinkras are starting to reach over into algebraic geometry very powerfully through the work that, uh, that uh, Charles and uh, some of his collaborators are pushing these days. So, why are Dinkras so magical? Well, because they can do this. You see, <coughs> if you, it's like Feynman graphs. If you Know the Feynman rules for Feynman graphs. You can go from the picture to a set of equations. That's what works here also. So how does it work? Let's go through this example pretty quickly. So this node, I'm going to give a name to. I'll call it phi. I'll call the upper node f. I'll call the two middle nodes psi 1 and psi 2. Now you'll notice that, um, that uh, the red line connects phi to psi 1. So remember, I told you that the lines are actually the orbits of the generators. And so what this tells us is that the first supercharge acting on the function phi connects to the first fermion psi 1. The second uh, charge, uh, supercharge acting on phi connects to psi 2. But the fact that it has a dashed line means that it has a minus sign compared to the transverse of the first. And that's the significance of putting dashes in the There's a way to put minus signs in transformation. Uh, the second, uh, the second, uh, I'm sorry, Acting with d1 on psi 1, according to this equation, should be the time derivative of phi. So d1 is the red link connected to psi 1. It does indeed connect to phi. But when you look at the Bancroft index, it's negative this time. 
Whereas before you were going from something a lower Bancroft number to higher Bancroft number, this time you went from higher Bancroft to lower. That forces, according to our rules, that you insert a time derivative. So that's where that's how these things are actually incorporating the presence of time derivatives by taking into account time. And uh, so this picture, if you study it long enough, you learn how to extract Feynman-like rules from the diagram to the difference equations and the states that they're acting on. Let's do. Uh, once you know the transformation laws, you can actually construct an invariant under the supercharges. And this invariant, as Bert said, obviously, yes, this is the invariant for this system, the simplest invariant. There are many such invariants. This is the simplest invariant that you can write. What about the other figure that we looked at? Which, that one by, that we just went through, we call the diamond for obvious reasons. This one we call the photon. Uh, if you actually look at the transformation laws, they come out. So many time derivatives are in different places because when you apply things, instead of moving up, this time you move down, but when you move down, you insert time derivatives. So it controls where the time derivatives are occurring in the transformation laws. And you can furthermore go ahead and construct the invariant, which turns out to be this. So that's a super invariant for the low time. And if you would compare the two invariants, you can see they're almost exactly, the, well, they are exactly the same in the fermionic sector. In the bosonic sector, you have, in the first case, an auxiliary field. But in the second case, you have a time derivative of something that potentially is a dynamical field. And so the thinkers have this very peculiar property of taking what we normally call auxiliary fields and supersymmetry, and depending on where you place the height of that node associated with the auxiliary field, the auxiliary field might become a propagating field. And so it's a symmetry that ties together this thing that we had always thought about in supersymmetry as being two classes of bosons that occur in a theory. One final thing before we leave this is that if you look at those super invariants, uh, in particular, if you look at the fermionic sectors, for those of you uh, who are not used to thinking about uh, anti-commuting quantities, uh, the second, third term, sorry, third and fourth term on each of these lines looks like it might be a fully derivative. Because if you use the ordinary rules of calculus, the time, the derivative of x squared is x dx. And that's what that looks like, those, uh, those third and fourth terms of each line. And so, they teach us very something very important about supersymmetry. Namely, if those are the invariants, then necessarily the bosons are part of what mathematicians would call a commuting ring of the functions. But the fermions are a form of an anti-commuting ring. Because if they are an anti-commuting ring, you can show, well, if they were a commuting ring, That set of equations would be valid. That equation would be valid. But that would say that it's a time derivative of psi squared, but it's inside of an action formula. This is therefore a surface term. Therefore, you have no dynamical evolution at all for the fermions. And so fermions necessarily are elements of an anti commuting ring. Notice there's no spin in this argument. Because normally, uh, certainly when I first learned about spinners, I always thought that fermions had something to do with the fact that they were double covered representations of the Lorentz group. There is no Lorentz group here. It is the fact that if you want dynamics to come out of a Lagrangian, it forces you to think about the fermions as, as elements in the antiquity ring. So, that's a Dinker 101 that I just told you. That's the basics of understanding what a Dinkers are about, and that's what we just went through. Now we're gonna go to a more complicated set of a Dinkers. Those were four colors, here are four of them. Could I ask yes, sir. Absolutely, Bert. Absolutely. I started with n equals one, and I get uh, you know trivial stuff. I get an auxiliary field f squared. But sometimes when I go to higher n, like n equal two, I will start getting uh, the auxiliary field begins to become dynamical, and uh, can I get derivative on it. You had auxiliary field becoming dynamical. Is there any relationship between your second line and possibly higher n supersymmetry in the old-fashioned? Um, yes, uh, let me say this. It is certainly true that if I write a higher derivative, in the old theory days, if I write a higher derivative action for the fields of a supermultiplet, 
the auxiliary fields then indeed become propagating. But here, I haven't actually done that. And, uh, it's not that I'm writing a higher derivative action. It's that the, in some sense, what goes on is, in terms of topology, the topology cares about zero modes. And it knows when you're moving things up and down. And that's the signal for the theory to either have a propagating boson or a non-propagating boson. It also applies to fermions and more complicated diagrams, too. So it's actually the topology that's at work here. Thank you. OK, so here are three of these diagrams, but this time with four colors. Now, all of these things actually started from a very interesting source. They started from the hypercube in four dimensions, where we applied the same rules to four. Square faces, uh, even odd, even odd. Every square face has to have an odd number of dashings on it, and parallel lines get the same color. And then we actually did one other process where we took the resulting di diagram and identified uh, subcells and said that one is actually a reflection of the other. So we, and we're just keeping the original cell, the cell is not the reflection. So it's, a, it's kind of a modding out that we're doing here of the hypercube. Uh, as Chuck would tell you, we use a block linear code to uh, mod out the, um, uh, the four-dimensional hypercube to get these things. So here's three examples. So you look at them, they look pretty similar. And one of the things that's really interesting is, yeah, they are pretty similar looking. And so when we first got these sorts of things, and I did this in some work with a bunch of undergraduates, in fact, I'm going to mention most of my research I'm talking about is even done with undergraduates. Um, you look at these things, you say, well, OK, they're the same or different with respect to what? How can I tell if these things are this representing the same supermolecule or some different supermolecule? So at this point, let me tell you about a little bit more mathematics. There's something called the cox setter group, BC4, which is the one way to think about BC4 is that it is the collection of all signed permutations acting on four objects. Um, it has, uh, because it's permutations, it means it's four factorial permutations. You put in a uh, plus or minus sign for each one, so that's a factor of two to four. That comes with 384 different elements in BC4. So BC4 is a well understood structure in mathematics, at least that's what I've been told. And uh, what's really interesting that we discovered a couple of years ago working with uh, one of my graduate students actually was that BC4 can be thought of as the union of 96 disjoint quartet, uh, qu elements that have each have four, I'm sorry, set, subsets that have each four elements in them. In discussion with uh, Ron today, uh, he was happy with this when we finally said that this leads to uh, the coxide group crossed with a coxide group modded out by the Klein four group. That's the last thing you wrote on the board. So these things, as I said, are you can find remnants of these structures in mathematical literature. And when you uh, take this representation, it turns out that there are 36,864 different diagrams that satisfy our rules for constructing a dangerous with four colors and four nodes, open nodes and four closed nodes. And in fact, I have a colleague named Yan Zhang who's actually figured out this number for arbitrary adinkras with n colors and d nodes and d number nodes. And there are very interesting combinatorial problems that arise in this structure. And Jan is one of the people who've actually been studying it in some fairly uh, great depth. So you're the four colors has to do with four It has to do with four superchargers. Yes. Because I'm ultimately I'm trying to gonna try to loop back to four dimensions. Yep, so in, in four dimensions, in order to have a spinorial supercharge, there are four components to the supercharge. And so that's why four color becomes relevant. But the reason I was heading at that, if it's given for any number of colors at some point, right? Uh, you mean the SO32 problem? Well, it turns out one so it turns out in one dimension supersymmetry is actually much more forgiving than it is in higher dimensions. Right. And in fact, there is no limit on the number of colors. Uh, we um, so one of the first things. So I, in 2010, I was on sabbatical uh, at MIT, and that's when I first met Jan, who was a graduate student of Richard Stanley, uh, the combinatorialist uh, at MIT. 
And one of the things that we had, uh, we physicists had wondered about is could we do this construction for any hypercube no matter how big? Because there could have been, in fact, something that stops you from doing it. And so one of the uh, problems that Jan actually solved was to prove that the, in particular, the rule that says every square face has to have an odd number of, of colors because, I'm sorry, odd numbers of dashings, that one could have failed dramatically. And but yet we need that rule in order to get a dangerous. He constructed a proof show that it never fails. There's something like a potential obstruction that's not there. So, uh, yeah, we can go for, it was a little bit of a surprise, but yeah, we can go on in this way for arbitrary numbers of supercharges. So, back to this question about when are these pictures the same or different? And this is a discussion I've been, I was having with my mathematical colleagues for the entire time we worked on this. And so, in a paper that I wrote with uh, Vincent Rogers, and uh, who was a student of uh, Professor Bala Chandran at uh, Syracuse some years ago, uh, we showed that um, that. When you look at these objects, there are interesting functions on pairs of them that map to the real numbers. We call these things gadgets. So, uh, if you take so the R's and these are two of these diagrams of the 36,864. I don't care which two you pick. They have a set of matrices associated with them, which, in the language of graph theory, are the adjacency matrices with some decoration. And so now. If you, uh, these things we call the Vs, which I showed you you get by taking commutators of supercharges instead of anti-commutators, for each representation you can calculate a V. And it's a matrix. And so therefore you can take two of them for two different representations, which we see on the far right hand side of that, take a trace over that, and then sum over the colors. That factor in front is a normalization factor. And what you find is that this map, which we call the first gadget, has some very interesting color properties. So let me tell you about the properties. There are 36,864 of these objects in this space. So you might say, when you take the overlap of these matrices, which are calculated from these objects, you might expect a sort of substantial number of answers. Turns out there are only four answers that come out of this calculation. And we know this because we wrote computer code to check all of this. The only numbers that come out are one, minus one third, plus one third, and zero. And this is out of the, this is a big 36,864 by 36,864. That's what we, when you see our papers with this, this number is 1.3 billion, we're actually looking at this matrix. Um, there's a second gadget, which you see at the bottom. The first one uh, we get by simply taking the, making the color index on the first, the color pair index on the first be the same as the color pair index on the second. The second gadget we get by using the levy tensor. tensor. So if this is 1, 2, that has to be 3, 4. And then, of course, permutations uh, according to levy That defines our second gadget. Now, if you calculate this, and this is a paper that actually Ron was referring to, because we've actually recently completed this calculation. If you, refer, if you do this calculation, you find out this thing returns one additional value of the first one, and one additional value is minus 1. So it's plus or minus one, plus or minus one third, zero. So these things are highly ordered, these things we call the dangerous. And in particular, uh, the gadget is a way that I convince my mathematical friends that there are differences in these pictures because you can do a calculation to get different numbers. The way to think of it is it's like taking the dot product between 36,864 vectors. If someone says, how do you know if they're the same or different? Well, if I take the dot product between a pair of them and I get one number, and then I take the dot product between uh, a third one and this, and I get a different number, then they're different. And so even though I don't know how to add a dangerous, in this sense of thinking about this as an inner product, and by the way, it's an inner product that's, uh, had, that uh, is bounded by zero. And so therefore, this thing we call gadget one actually leads to a definition of angles, because it's a, basically it's a Euclidean metric placed on the space of graphs. Um, now, there's another way to think about these things, and that is because of the relationship of the uh, L matrices and R matrices to the Clifford algebra, which I showed you some time ago, it means when you change the sign in the middle, it's like taking not the anti-commutator Clifford generators, but the commutator. 
And we know that when you take the commutator Clifford generators, you get representations of ON. So that means that every one of these V things that I'm calculating is some representation of SO4 here. And therefore, if you start with any particular diagram, you calculate this V. We know that its V must be a representation of SO4. And so therefore, we can start with the standard basis SO4 and decompose any other of the Vs with respect to that basis. And that leads us to write the Vs in terms of these coefficients that we call L and L tilde. And these objects are the standard basis that I'm talking about, and the 36 coefficients. When you express the gadget in terms of the two gadgets in terms of these coefficients, it is immediately obvious that if you take a representation, two representation, take the second representation to be the same as the first representation, then this is a non-negative quadratic form. And since it's non-negative, it means uh, since it's non-negative for the same object, it means I can think of this as a Euclidean metric which means I can define angles between the, the adinkras, the graphs, by this means. The second gadget doesn't have that property. You'll notice it has some minus signs. So we cannot use it to define angles between the representations. We can only use the first gadget. There's the angle at the top. There are curious identities between these two gadgets. I won't spend too much time. But let me just note uh, this one relationship I can get my cursor to block everything. There's one relationship here, which is that if you look at the diagonal entries of the second gadget, it defines a Z2 value function, which only takes some values plus or minus one. And that turns out to be very useful to know if you're doing calculations with these things. Okay. So, we're finished with the Dinker land. We're now time, time to become fuel fierce and ornamental and talk about supers. So let's do that. Uh, I did this, uh, as I said, mostly with a bunch of undergraduates. In fact, every single person except for me on this paper is an undergraduate. Uh, there were, uh, we had uh, one undergraduate from the University of Chicago, Chicago Isaac Quinn. Uh, we had uh, an undergraduate from MIT, Mayawa. And uh, there I am. I'm the only white hair in this. Everybody else is a kid. So uh, I have lots of fun working with undergraduates these days. And it really shows that undergraduate education can really empower authentic research in places where no one else knows the answer. And I've been doing this for a while now. And this is a second such paper. Oops. So these are super moments in four dimensions. Burke will recognize this. The person was a chiral moment. Because he's written, I don't know how many papers about it over the course of the years. So have I. All of us who have worked with supersymmetry uh, for years and years, this is the thing that contains what we call the electron meets electron, this chiral multiplets. The middle multiplets with vector multiplet is a multi super multiplet that contains, for example, the photon or any of the spin one force carriers of the standard model. Uh, it's accompanied by a set of objects that we call, if this is the photon, that's the photino. If this were an SU3 uh, W plus minus and Z, then this, these are the uh, winos that are associated with that and the zeno. And so these are the multiplets that people build the standard model. These are their building blocks for constructing the standard model. And then this final multiple that I've written down here is something that was first discovered by my friend Warren Siegel. It's uh, got a couple of different names. It's called the linear multiplet by a lot of people. And in string theory, if you're talking about a string theory that includes gravity, this super multiplet always shows up because it's the dil dilaton axiom. But in the con we're not doing string theory. We're just looking at representation of supersymmetry, but this is another representation of supersymmetry. Well known. So, how would you get at the eigen-like values associated with these things. Our discussion in terms of graphs answered that question. It said you can't get them by using the uh, symmetry generator linearly. You have to use it quadratically. And so in other words, instead of checking the closure of the commutator algorithm, you switch the sign in the middle, and then you calculate to see what happens. If you do that calculation on uh, these three multiplets, you find this. 
you find on the spinner in the fermion multiplet, you get some object which is only purely numbers. It's a, it's a spinner, it's a tensor, a fourth order spinner tensor. It's only got four spinner indices, but it's a number. You got no functions in it. You do the calculation on the vector multiplet, and you find a different set of numbers. You do the calculation on the tensor multiplet, and again, you find a the number. These are the kind of conditions you need to find eigenvalues. In fact, these things, H's, look like some tensor extension of the notion of an eigenvalue. And so, if you actually calculate those objects for each multiplet, you find that it takes a uniform form, given by this expression here, where P, Q, R, and S are integers. For each of those multiplets, this is all that happens. The rest of this stuff is got to do with feared seeing the kind of stuff that Bert is an expert at. You do have these stupid feared identities all over the place. And everything else here has to do with those. But the important thing is, there's a lattice structure here. And lattices are what you need to do something like representation theory like. So you calculate them, and you find out that the numbers for each of the multiplets is given here. Now remember, this knows nothing about a dangerous. This is all just in four dimensions, the kind of calculation, like I said, me and Bert have been doing for 30, 40 years, but we're changing the signs of the supercharges as, we're, uh, instead of checking the closure, we're changing the sign between these. And you just get this stuff out. Now, this is very interesting uh, because of this lattice structure. It means I can think of these representations as sitting at the vertices of a, of a, of a tetrahedron. Because what the numbers that you see in the parentheses are just taken from that table that I showed you. And you think of them as coordinates in a Euclidean space. And in other words, points that sit on a lattice. Now, um, you'll, uh, you'll say, well, is that really the case? Let me show you one more thing. So it turns out that what's really going on is the following. The vector and tensor multiplet are the ones that are sitting at these vertices. These other objects are the parity rules. Because if you start, for example, with the vector multiplet, the spin one field in the multiplet is a vector. There is another the supersymmetrical theory where that spin one field is replaced by an axial vector. So I call that the parity dual of the first. If you start with the chiral multiplet, it turns out it is its own parity dual. Because in the chiral multiplet, if you look at the propagating scalar, uh, the spin zero degrees, there's a scalar and a pseudo-scalar. So you do a parity transformation on that, and you still get a scalar and a pseudo-scalar. And so, uh, so I you know, added the parity duals here, and then finally, the chiral multiplet actually sits up in this space uh, orthogonal to the, because it's a four-dimensional space, so you can think of the chiral multiplet as being at the apex of a vertex. These things begin to have the smell of, of root and weight space. That's what we're exposing here. Uh, the way you get this from four to, uh, down to one dimensions is a process where you just take the four dimensional theory and uh, reduce it along a single uh, constant line in the four light cone. You might as well take that line to, to lie on the temporal axis because you can always Lorentz transform it to the temporal axis. So take your four dimensional theory Get, uh, set all by hand, set the coordinates equal to zero, and therefore their derivatives equal to zero, and keep only temporal derivatives. And at the end of the process, you're going to get some set of equations. Those equations are these. <laughs> so that I purposely actually at the beginning just picked the three that came from the projection from the four dimensional theory. So the theory projects. So how much information is in here? Because it's really interesting that I know how to distinguish. So I've been working on that, and that's where these billion calculation papers come on. They're coming up from me in my talk pretty quickly, thank goodness. Uh, the latest one, which Ron was kind enough to mention, is here. And what we uh, did over the entire billion calculations uh, by computer algorithm is calculate the value of these overlaps. Uh, like I said, they're 36,864 by 36,864 matrices calculate every entry in them. Uh, what we're showing here, uh, oh, we often work on what we call the small library, which is, uh, if you, in my discussion, I talked about BC4, how it naturally leads to a set of adinkras. If you work just with BC4, you'll find it's a 9696 matrix. We often run tests in that small subcell to see if we're understanding the structures of what's going on before we take the leap into these big numbers. Uh, 
since so few food values come out, early today Ron said there has got to be a nice mathematical way to figure out why only these numbers occur. And I agree with him. So if anybody in the audience is motivated enough to try to figure out why only these numbers occur, I'd love to, to have that discussion with you. So this is derived the computer code. Yes. By two. actual sit down, take the graph, calculate its V's, calculate the overlaps, see what comes out of the people. So one thing about this process is since so the numbers are so large, you don't really want to write matrices with numbers. So one way you can you can get around that is uh, by assigning pixel values. So the number minus one will assign pixel value blue, minus one third red, zero will have zero pixel value. Uh, plus one third will be black, and plus one will be green. And if you do that over the 96 by 96 library, you get this. And we didn't put this there, this is just the output. And you shouldn't, for those of you who are thinking somehow that we're becoming proselytizers for some religion, we're not doing that because if you ordered the library in a different order, you would have a different picture. This just happened to be the picture with the set of choices that we made that came out. And yes, it's true, that we finished this just before Christmas. <laughs> so this is the first gadget. If you look at the second gadget, it looks like this. If you look at, the, let me go back to the first one. There's something interesting about the first one. It has no factors of minus one. So there are no black pixels in that. Second gadget has lots of minus ones. And this is again of the small library. In fact, the number of minus ones of uh, the second gadget is equal to the number of plus ones. The number of minus one thirds is equal to the plus the number of one thirds in the small gadget. Yes, sir. Is there a way? Is there something special that you know about the ones that are sort of above the red? Hat? Again, this is just give the computer a code and let it calculate. In fact, but you raise a very interesting I question. Mean, it's, I mean, it's about how to go numbering the graphs. Of that's, that yeah, that's what's determining the actual, is how we're deciding to order the, and that's an arbitrary order. That's why I said you should assign no special significance to these figures, except that they are a way to actually look at these overlap matrices uh, in a way that's kind of accessible to your brain, because our visual computing power far exceeds what we do with other things in our brain. And so, as I said, we've done it over the entire sets. And then we like to look like this over the 36,964. And so, what am I faced with? Well, in four dimensions, I showed you that I can forget about a decrease. I know how to calculate a set of integers for minimal multiplets. In one dimensions, I know how to calculate the overlap. So how, so the question is, if you start in one dimension, can you make the trip back? Can you make the trip back? And what that corresponds to is a problem in computer vision. You see, in four dimensions, those that tetrahedral pyramid thing that I showed you, that is some object in four-dimensional root space, not uh, configuration space. It casts a shadow down into the world of one-dimensional networks. This is a computer vision problem. This is a, this is a, um, the other word they have for it, a uh, shape recognition problem. Whether you can cast a particular shape. Because if you can cast the shape, it means that yes, there was a way to get back up. So I'm, I don't understand yet the details of what's, what are the rules on this uh, shadow casting. But we are now in the realm of saying, I gotta now talk to people who are specialists in computer vision to figure out something about representation of supersymmetry. Thank you.